Hey listeners, it's your host, Aisha. So in this episode of Classical Classroom, you are going to learn all about a kind of music that I actually kind of grew up with. Video game music. It was pretty much on in my house from the time that my brother was in diapers, which I actually have a picture of, which I'll post with this episode, which he'll kill me for. Also look for that on our social media. Sorry, Adam. Um, But since I was a kid, video game music has become a whole different beast. Video games have soundtracks. Symphony orchestras play them. And so in this episode, we're going to focus on the music of Final Fantasy. Um, Basically, this episode is going to be a nerdtastic extravaganza. So don't forget to subscribe to us, rate us, and review us on iTunes because it will help us level up. Sorry. Okay, I'm done. My name is Daisha Clay. I'm the audio librarian here at Classical 91.7. While I'm a real librarian, I have a deep, dark secret. I know very little about classical music. I grew up listening to rock. And I know something about jazz. But when it comes to classical... But I really want to learn. So, every week on this show, a classical music expert will give me a piece of classical music they think I should know. And then we'll discuss it. Come learn with me in the Classical Classroom. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Classical Classroom. I'm Daisha Clay, and here with me today is Leslie Sable and Joshua Zinn. Our Leslie Sable and Joshua Zinn. (laughs) So Leslie Sable is the director of popular programming at the Houston Symphony. She was previously general manager of the Modesto Symphony Orchestra and the orchestra librarian at the Sacramento Philharmonic. I'm also a librarian. I was also operations manager there too. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, okay. So I did a lot of things. The 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 <laughs> Googles, they 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 lie sometimes. <laughs> and Joshua Zinn is a composer who moonlights as an announcer and content producer here at Houston Public Media. Among many things, he's the co-producer and host of our show, Music in the Making. More importantly, Josh is a um, self-avowed media nerd, and uh, he is our in-house expert on today's topic, which is Josh. Final Fantasy music. Nice. Okay, so before we get into talking about the music of Final Fantasy, I think we need to say a little bit about the mythology of Final Fantasy itself. So can you kind of uh, give us some background and tell us the story? Sure, sure. I'd be happy to. The year was 1987. The video game industry was on fire. Nintendo led the charge with the side-scrolling wonder Super Mario Brothers. But then, from an unlikely developer on the verge of bankruptcy, came a new adventure. Final Fantasy emerged, changing the gaming world forever. It had everything. Magic, combat, dragons, monsters, swords, airships, kings, queens, alternate dimensions. Every fantasy trope gamers could imagine. Each Final Fantasy game is a self-contained choose-your-own-adventure story on steroids. 14 installments and almost 30 years later, Final Fantasy remains one of the most beloved RPGs in the canon. So thanks, Josh. That was a little weird. Um, So Leslie, can you say a little bit about what popular programming is at Houston Symphony? Yes. So I'm in charge of basically almost everything that isn't your hardcore classical. So we have a Pops series, which is a nine concert weekend series. And then we also do one-off specials. So that means bringing in uh, Smokey Robinson or Earth, Wind & Fire or Ben Folds for one night only. Mm-hmm. Why, why is it important to an organization that their sort of mission is about classical music? Why is this kind of programming important to them? Well, our musicians are extremely versatile, and doing pops, we get to explore other genres of music, like pop music, rock music, Broadway, soundtracks, uh, jazz, 
country, bluegrass, all all the genres of music the orchestra can play and plays very, very well. So we think it's important to bring that music to our audiences in Houston to just showcase the variety that's out there and yeah. that uh, an orchestra isn't just about classical music, as I'm using air quotes, <laughs> classical music. Yeah. Well, and can you talk about the different audiences that the this kind of music draws as opposed to your, your typical classical performance? Yes. So our Pops concerts are a little more, I would say, accessible to mm-hmm. just a, a mainstream audience goer, say, who really loves classic rock. We did the music of David Bowie a couple weekends ago. Nice. So it was a tribute to his great catalog, and we did about 20 of his greatest hits. Uh-huh. So you know, there were people there that had painted their faces like David Bowie. They were dressed up. They oh, had a insane. great time. Yeah. There was dancing. There was screaming. There were, you know, people shouting out songs they wanted to hear from the audience. No it was way. really kind of like a rock concert. And, you know, we have full-blown lighting and hazers. And it's it's just a really, really fun time. But, you know, playing really great music that just doesn't happen to be of the classical repertoire. Do you find that that those kinds of concerts bring, like, do those audiences begin to bleed over into your more traditional, like, when somebody goes out and sees something like that and they're, they're impressed by what an orchestra can do, do you, do you find that those people start coming to a symphony concert? I think concert? When, when Pops was first created, yeah. that was the goal, I think, yeah. was this was your starter, your introduction. Okay, like your training to, wheels. Exactly. Yeah. But we've found over the years that that's just not the case. It's just a different, I hate to use, use this term because, you know, it's an art, but it's a different product line. It's, yeah. it, it's no, we're in a sense. business and it, it is a different product line that we, we have. Mm-hmm. And this audience is very, very loyal to what they like, which is pops. And say yeah. our tagline is the music you know, the music you love. So that brings me to an important question for this show. Why Final Fantasy? Like what makes that a good series for for the symphony? So we've been doing video game concerts, I think, since 2006. We okay. started with Video Games Live, which our audiences will, will know. Uh, we've had them back about two or three times, three times, I believe. But they, I think, were the ones who really started this whole uh, genre. Mm-hmm. And we have been cultivating that audience for um, you know 10 years and we find that the music is is good it's really good and yeah. it's the audience for these shows is none that i've ever seen before in my life in fact when uh, i came to interview here the summer of 2011 it happened to be a final fantasy weekend uh-huh. and i had never experienced one of these shows before in in my career and I could not believe how well behaved the audience was. <laughs> I mean, I was I didn't know what to expect, but everyone was dressed up. Everyone was so excited. Wait, when you say dress up, were they like in, in, costumes. in costume? Yes. Nice. Yes. And they were so appreciative and just sit there sitting there, their attention was glued to the orchestra and to the screens and so everything. Great. And it was it was amazing. And since I've been here, every single time we have a video game show, it's the same. Yeah. And I I love it. It's great people watching, but it's also wonderful to see them appreciative of the orchestra and what they're able to do. I want to talk a little about the evolution of video game music. So so like video games have been around since Pong, but it's it's a pretty recent thing that they've you know become such elaborate productions that they actually have their own soundtracks. Josh, can you say a little about when this became an industry of its own? Well, the obviously with the growth of video games uh, comes the growth of technology because that's what video games are entirely based out of. So when you think of, of things like Pong and you, you imagine Pong in your head, if you've ever played it or you've ever seen it played, you have those little boop, boop, like uh-huh. all these, like these weird digitized sounds. And that was all that, that, they were, that those machines were capable of. 
And so the same thing goes for the kind of music that you could produce. So if, if anybody's familiar with, you know, old fashioned uh, Nintendo Entertainment System music, Super Mario Brothers, that digitized 8-bit sound was, was all that they, that, that machine was capable of doing. Yeah. But even still, what I think is great about that is that they were still able to make some really compelling, catchy tunes with those kind of basic digitized yeah. sounds. And so they explored those possibilities throughout the 80s. And then as the technology grew, the capabilities of the music grew. And so you had a system like the Super Nintendo, which had a more advanced uh, hardware and had more advanced Mm sounds. And so you could create almost orchestral sounding textures. You could create something that sounded like strings or something that sounded like brass or woodwinds. And that created... A, video, a set of video games that that the music is kind of coming more to the to the foreground and becoming yeah. one of the most important yeah. parts of the game. And as the technology has grown, as these systems have gotten more advanced, mm-hmm. the music has gotten better. It's the instrument you can actually use live soundtracks on video games now. Well, and and I was going to say that you know talking about like the the Super Nintendo and things like that, like the music, while it does. Uh, set the stage and kind of get you just like mentally in the mood it also signals certain things happening in the game like when you get to different parts of super mario brothers different sounds and different music happen it's like you're you're in a dark creepy part and there's like cheesy dark creepy music playing and so it's interesting it's it's unlike say watching a movie you you may come back to the same music over and over again. So so yeah. Anyway, but it just... will. But at the same time, it's also a lot like watching a movie because you have these themes and things that represent certain characters or or scenes or moments in a uh-huh. game. Um, you know, like the. I mean, you talk about the scores of John Williams. Those are known for memorable themes, and characters have specific themes. Yeah. And just like that, that's happened in video games too, especially okay. in the music of Final Fantasy, where uh, the the main composer of the series is Nobuo Yamatsu, and he composed the music for pretty much the first nine main titles. And then afterwards, other composers started coming in, and he slowly sort of phased out of it. Um, but he created all of these really familiar themes. That that carry throughout the different games and for each individual game uh, themes that represent characters or the battles that you get into and there's a victory fanfare and all this kind of stuff. Um, and so w- with that, one of the most uh, one of the most prevalent themes in the entire series is what's known as the prelude. Mm-hmm. Uh, the prelude to Final Fantasy is this really simple uh, theme, but and it's it, it was in the very first Final Fantasy game for the original Nintendo, and it's been in almost every game since. Oh my god, it's been out for that long? Yes, 1987. Which, I gotta <laughs> say, it's ironic that it's called Final Fantasy, because there have been a lot of them. <laughs> right. It just keeps happening. But if we could listen to the, the prelude. Um, so this is, this is a, a theme that usually starts at the beginning of a game. At, it's a prelude, so it takes place before. It's kind of the introduction. Yeah. Um, and it's the first thing you hear in the first game. Uh, this is an orchestral version. This is this is the one of the orchestral arrangements that a lot of orchestras do. Um, and you know, it's, it's very simple. It's got this nice arpeggiated line in the harp. And it, it, I don't know, to me, it just, it kind of just exudes that kind of fantastic, like you, there's an adventure about to come and there's yeah. all this, you know, it's just, it's such a nice, simple way and it's a nice simple theme that has been carried throughout the different games in the series. Yeah. Obviously, they didn't have choirs singing this in the in the original game, um, but uh. it's it's the same melody. It's the same kind of uh, melodic figures. Yeah, I was gonna ask about the orchestration, like like um, I'm well, I'm guessing for the the original game, orchestration was, you know, it, it was, was little beeps beep, and boops. Yeah, exactly. It was it was just like that. Um, but one of the one of the things that I think is really 
uh, interesting about this kind of music is that it actually can sometimes borrow from traditional classical music as mm. we know it. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the one of the pieces that there's not really a piece that I can immediately think of that sounds exactly like this piece, but one of the th- first pieces that comes to mind that might have been an influence on it is Bach's first prelude from the Well Tempered Clavier. Whoa. So th- this is a piece that probably most casual classical music listeners know. And it's very simple. It's just these arpeggiated lines, and but they create this melodic kind of shape and this this harmony that's sort of implied. And the the, the Final Fantasy Prelude's just like that. It's just these rising and falling figures that are basically mm-hmm. just simple arpeggios, which are you know things that every pianist can do. Right. Nice, so. nice. Well, I'm I'm, I'm curious too. Um, how did the music grow? And, and do we eventually find, are we now today, for example, finding that we've, we actually do have like chamber groups playing the music that people are hearing or, or like, are we still using synthesizers? Are we like at, at this point, we pretty much, well, it depends. I mean, at this point, we have the capability of having recorded musicians play a live soundtrack to a video game. But also at the same time, if, you know, for instance, it's not in the budget or, uh-huh. or you're not able to get performers, there are actual uh, programs that uh, that kind of take recorded sounds from live musicians and pretty much you can put them into a sequence and, and, and use them to create the um, illusion that you're listening to a live orchestra or, or a live choir or something. Yeah. These are very realistic sounding uh, synthesizers, basically, uh-huh. and they're used all over the place. They can be used in video games. They can be used in movies. Mm-hmm. A lot of composers use them to create demo tracks to, to kind of as a portfolio to send out to directors and things like that. Basically, either way, you can get realistic sounding music in video games now. And absolutely, the music in Final Fantasy now uses more realistic sounds like Mm -hmm. this that that sound like they're actual instruments being played, whether or not they're live recorded or Or, or just, you know, sequenced uh, instruments. So what we're listening to right now is not actual people playing music right right it, it it's it's sort of mimics the sound of actual instruments and and some of these instruments may have been previously recorded but the this putting together this is not like a session where they're sitting in a, in a studio recording the composer just has these sounds that he then layered the music into he layered these notes in and they just kind of play back kind of like a synthesizer it's robot music <laughs> <laughs> Leslie, how does it look at one of these performances that the the symphony does? And and I'm I'm wondering too since we're kind of talking about how the music is utilized in the game and how you can keep coming back to the same music over and over again. How do you structure a symphony performance? I mean, and are we talking about <laughs> this question's all over the place. Are we talking like Full symphony orchestra up there. How do you approach pro- the program for this? So I worked with the conductor, to who is kind of the visionary creator, the one who's been doing this uh, for a very long time. His name is Arnie Roth. And he came up with the program, and we talked about it. And it will feature all 87 members of the Houston Symphony. There might be little more or less depending on you know how many strings we're using that day but we're also using members of the Houston Symphony chorus so there'll be voices like you heard in the prelude they will be live on stage so what we do is we hang a, a large screen above the orchestra and they sync it up with a, a click track I believe we're using click track for that so the conductor and Some of the musicians, maybe all of the musicians, it depends on if they like using it or not. They'll have an earbud in that has like a metronome and it syncs up with the images. And so the conductor is in charge of keeping everyone together and in the right place at the right time. Uh Um, It's it's fascinating to watch. And when you're sitting in the audience, uh, a lot of times for not only these video game shows, but when we do a, a live film, 
Mm-hmm. Next weekend, we're doing Raiders of the Lost Ark, nice. full film. So the conductor has a screen, a television screen right in front of them. And they follow what are called streamers and punches. Mm-hmm. So it it uh, their bars go across the screen that tell you the tempo and where you should be and how many beats are in a measure and that kind of thing. So that not only do they have to follow their score uh-huh. and conduct the orchestra and make it musical and beautiful, they have to know, they have to sync it up So live. they're playing a video game while conducting. Pretty much. Play. That's yeah. crazy. It's very complicated. <laughs> wow. But a lot of them uh, find it very fun and entertaining yeah. to do and a challenge. So Yeah. That's, wow. I had no idea that that was going on behind the scenes. Josh, tell us some more about the music. We've so we've heard just the prelude and 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 the Bach sort of potential influence on that. Like, right. um, where do we go from there? Well, um, there's actually a few other um, other examples from the game series that that I th- that I think are influenced by um, Bach and and generally early music. Um, mm-hmm. So I've got three examples that we can listen to. Okay. Um, so the first one is from uh, Final Fantasy VI. Uh, this is called Dancing Mad, and this is from the final boss fight in the game, uh, which is it's it's staggered into four different parts. And so this is the third part of the fight okay. where you're basically the 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 imagery in the fight is that you're starting very low. It's it's like you're rising up towards the heavens. And so this part, you're just about to break through the clouds and you're fighting this kind of angelic looking uh, creature. And you've got this kind of music here. Oh, and what game system are we on now? This would be for Super Nintendo. Okay. So this is organ music. You know, this yeah. is the kind of stuff that, that Bach would write. This is the kind of stuff that all kinds of Baroque composers were writing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's got this kind of contrapuntal, you know, nature to it. It's got these multiple lines going. Um, and so there's another piece from Bach's Well-Tempered Clavier that actually is in the same key. It's in C sharp, and it sounds very similar to, to the section we just heard. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a little That's, faster, it's a little more right. upbeat, but it's got that same kind of you know that da 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 that kind of pattern yeah. that 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 Bach would use all the time in his music. Um, there's another piece. There's a there's a piece from uh, Final Fantasy VII. Uh, this is uh, for a. It's kind of an amusement park, and it's it's this. I, I like to think of this particular track as like Bach, but in like electronic-y kind of fun techno world. Uh-huh. And you'll you'll you hear with that with the Gold Saucer. That's the name of this one. Okay. <laughs> this definitely sounds like video game yeah, music. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It's, it's like, perfect for it's video like game music. It's like Japanese Bach, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and and so, um, you know, this is this is this is especially very Bach-like because it has three different contrapuntal lines doing different things. Mm-hmm. And so there's this Bach trio um, that that's for that's that he wrote for organ. That's got three different lines. That and actually, the theme for this Bach piece is very similar to what we just heard in the Gold Saucer. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's it's got that same kind of feel. You've got three different lines and they're, you know, it's kind of a jaunty piece. And mm-hmm. so that that I think is a very powerful. I th- I feel like Nobu Imatsu probably listened to this piece before he wrote uh, the Gold Saucer theme. Um, and then the last one in this kind of vein of early music is from Final Fantasy IX. And this is um the name of the track is called uh, The Place I'll Return to Someday. This is the this is the very first thing you hear when you load the game and you're at the menu screen. Okay. And it's a theme that carries throughout the piece and this this is more like the Renaissance than the Baroque. Mm-hmm. 
There's a lot of uh, fake pan flute going yeah, on Yeah, it's in like, there. yeah, recorder pan flute kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. um, and I found this piece by uh, Fresco Baldi, who was a, a, re- a late Renaissance composer, um, that's in the same mode as this piece, and he also uses recorders. So it kind of has that same kind of feel. Yeah. So that's wow. I think there's, that's, I think that's there's crazy. a pretty clear connection of Definitely. some kind there. So. So, so who are and 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 this can go to you, Leslie. Who are these people who are composing for video games now? Like like what what composers have you featured? Maybe Josh can com- comment on Josh composers. may know more about the specific <laughs> composers, <laughs> okay. but I, I do know that Mr. Yamatsu is known as a rock star. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, he is, people go nuts for him. Really? He has a huge, huge following in yeah. the gaming world for sure. Probably our biggest success recently has been The Legend of Zelda. Uh, we did Koji Kondo is the composer for that series. Mm-hmm. I knew you Thank would you. know that. <laughs> <laughs> so we did two performances last October, I believe it was, and pretty much sold both of them out. Um, people just love that music, and it's been around for 25 or 30 years. Um, I think the first Zelda game came out in 86. Okay. So, yeah, wow. about 30 years 30 now. years. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And I remember playing the original when I was a kid, and I had a great time. I think I solved that one, but that was <laughs> I pretty much stopped playing after that. Uh, <laughs> we also did uh, uh, Pokemon, nice, and we've done a, some video game compilation mm-hmm. shows. Okay, so. and when you are putting these shows together, as just strictly part of your research, do you spend a lot of time playing the games? No, I, I don't. They're actually <laughs> <laughs> the truth comes out, people. Uh, no, then they're they're mostly packages okay. that we we just work with the conductor directly oh, and make sure that we're not repeating things from the last time. Okay, but I do have. There are quite a few gamers on staff, uh-huh. so I uh, I do some research by asking. So, what do you think of? This game and yeah, and uh, so you have in-house experts. In-house experts for sure. Nice, Josh. Um, we've got a little more time for some music. Where should we go next? Well, one of the uh, one of the most interesting uh, classical music connections with Final Fantasy comes in Final Fantasy VI. Um, and, and anyone who's familiar with that game will remember that there is a pretty lengthy opera sequence in that game. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, without getting into the plot too much, inevitably the characters have to go through this opera as part of kind of this ruse that one of the main characters is is in on. And, and she's uh, she's basically going undercover as the lead soprano in this opera. Yeah. Um, and so this opera, it's it's got... Uh, the Nobu Yamatsu actually wrote so, several pieces for this opera. He wrote an overture. He wrote this aria. Um, there's a waltz. There's a duel scene, and then there's a big grand finale where you have this fight at the end of the at the end of the show. So the the overture is. I can't, I can't think of a specific overture that is like it, but it's it's so operatic and very dramatic and, and romantic, and it just you know has all of these bombastic hits, and there's singing in it, um, and we can listen to that now and, and just get a feel for that. Like completely sounds. I'm, I mean, this is just a piece of classical music. This is right. I mean, obviously, you know, again, this is an orchestrated version, so it's not how it sounded in the original game. But yeah. it's it was. This is the same music. I mean, it's got all these you know fake cymbal crashes and all of this you right. know string stuff and big brassy moments. Yeah. Um. So it's really cool. Um. And then there's the uh, there's the aria. 
which is, you know, very typical. Uh, the the lead soprano is pouring her heart out to to her her long lost love who's away at war and she's waiting for him to come home to her, mm -hmm. and it's very tender. about this it's like video games are like a modern day interactive opera yeah. like it's choose your own yeah. adventure opera opera whoa it totally is because yeah. all the the light motifs that mm -hmm. go through uh -huh. all the games right. yeah yeah And this sounds much better than it does in the game with a fake voice that's not <laughs> saying any lines. It's just a Super Nintendo sound, but it's it's a scene that with a lot of gamers I think elicits some emotion anyway, just because uh -huh. you're 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 invested in these characters and the music makes just it creates this great scene and the art uh, decoration of the of the game itself is really nice mm -hmm. um but you know you compare this piece to uh, an aria famous aria like Costa Diva from Norma by Bellini and it's you know not not necessarily completely similar but they have similar qualities So it's that that typical, you know, pouring out of emotion and, and the aria is about is all about emotion and it's about the you know, it's basically kind of a soliloquy where the soprano singing or whoever the soloist is is singing to themselves about something mm -hmm. that they, they want or they, they need something to happen. Um, so it's it's very much in that kind of vein. Yeah. And then uh, after that there's the waltz. I like that you're putting Todd to work. <laughs> So it's it's got that typical waltz character. It's in three four time. It's yeah. very bouncy, and this is very similar to Tchaikovsky's waltz from Sleeping Beauty. It's not completely the same melody, but it's got the same yeah. contour. It sounds yeah. very similar, and it's the same kind of you know just. Very light and happy waltz, and it's you know it's 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 I think it, I think there's definitely a, a, an influence there yeah. on this one. Well, and and clearly the composer of this music is like very knowledgeable about about yeah. classical music. It's sure. kind of kind of using yeah. influences from from all of these different periods right. and really tying the music for this game to that tradition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Very purposefully. Yeah. Um, and there's another. Uh, it's sticking with Tchaikovsky. So there's the there's the duel which happens right after the waltz. This is when um, these enemy soldiers invade uh, the 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 palace that they're in right now. So there's another Tchaikovsky example. There's a dual scene in his opera Eugene Onegin, um, which that's that's a pistol duel, and this duel's more for swords. But it's it's the same. It's got almost the same kind of uh, orchestral textures. That was the gunshot. Bang. <laughs> and so yet again, it seems yeah. like he was he was definitely cribbing some things from, right. from classical music. And then finally there's the there's the finale of the opera, which is it's a weird scene where uh, one of this villain that you've encountered earlier in the game has kind of foiled your plan, and now you have to fight him off in the midst of this opera, and it completely interrupts the show. So it, it, it's <laughs> but it's also kind of a comical scene. Okay.
And so... So you're the, fighting to the death to this very happy sounding music. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. It's a, it's a big <laughs> boss battle to this very light and, and happy music. Um, and the, the the piece that I think of with this one is, is it might be a little obscure, but this is uh, Jacques Hibert's uh, Bacchanal. Yeah. So it's. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I think. It. I think it. I think it sounds kind of similar. It's got that same jaunty feel to it, but also that kind of bouncy. Yeah. You know, lots of heavy brass. Right. You could totally fight to the death to that. Oh, too. sure. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so, I, I would want to. That's that's the music I would select <laughs> if I were to fight somebody to the death. I think there's something wrong with you if that engenders in you a violent. I played this game at a young age, formative years. You know, just you. kind of, you know. It's, yeah, that's it affected me deeply. I understand. So, Leslie, the performance, uh, the Houston Symphony's performance of Distant World, music from Final Fantasy, is happening on July 23rd. And you can go to the Houston Symphony's website to find out more about that if you would like to attend the concert. Um, and can you please give listeners some hints about what they should be expected to wear to such a performance and how they can really like get into the spirit of this thing. Yes. So something also very exciting is that we added a matinee performance because we were running out of seats. So we have a 2.30 and a 7.30 performance. Oh, nice. Yes. So exciting. Uh, I would say, you know, people really like to showcase their favorite characters Uh and, uh, Props are in- encouraged, I would say. Uh, <laughs> and uh, usually we have, you know, photographers running around taking photos, but it's it's really just a good time for you to come and hang out in the lobby a little bit before the concert and see all your um, fellow gamers. See who has the biggest styrofoam sword from Final Fantasy yes. VII. <laughs> yes, but please don't obstruct people's view during the concert. Yes, <laughs> Have a good time, but don't get crazy, people. That's that's what I'm hearing. Um, so, Josh, uh, take us out on um, on a good piece of music here. I okay. Don't know where to go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this one is probably the. I, I don't want to say it's the most popular, but it's definitely one of the most popular pieces from the whole series. Uh, this is from Final Fantasy VII. This is the music for the final boss fight in the game. Uh, it's called One Winged Angel, and it's. I'll, I'll let it speak for itself as to why people enjoy this piece so okay. much. Well, Leslie Sable and Joshua Zinn, thank you so much for being on the Classical Classroom. I really appreciate you guys coming on today. Thanks for having me. Thank you. It's been very cool. All right, listeners, that does it for this episode of Classical Classroom. For more Classroom, go to houstonpublicmedia.org slash classroom. Check out the veritable cornucopia of social media links on that web page. You can email me at dclay at houstonpublicmedia.org. And you can subscribe to us, rate us, and review us on iTunes. And uh, please do. Thanks today to audio producer Todd Tado Hulslander for twiddling knobs. Thanks to Mark DeClaudio for his piercing piazzu eyes. Thanks to Josh Zen and Leslie Sable for being here again, once again. Um, thanks to me for saying words. But most of all, thanks to you for listening. We'll catch you next time. I guess I don't need to be as close to the microphone as I thought. That sounds really good right there, just like that. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah. clears throat>